So thanks everyone for being here tonight for WMA's special artist talk. Tonight we're going to bring a little bit of West Alabama to Southeast Alabama featuring the life and times of the prolific artist Glenn House Sr. Uh, currently, Glenn's ceramic faces are on view at WMA and the Kudzu Soliloquy exhibition. They will be on view until June 27th. So if you um, are in the area or you want to make a special trip down, feel free. Um, and then just diving right into it, uh, Mark Hughes Cobb will be presenting tonight. He is also a Dothan native. Um, when did you leave Dothan? What year Dothanian? Was is it Dothanian yeah. or Dothanite? Yeah. Uh, Dothanite. Away. I was like 12, so it's been a long uh, time. Ah, okay, okay. I went to Houston some... Academy. I was a Raider. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, I was thinking that you had graduated from Dothan High. I don't know why I had that in my mind. Nope. nope. But I had older brothers who did. Okay. George, um, Dothan High. Houston so, Academy. So, um, the place. Mark Hughes Cobb has been in the arts, entertainment, and a feature writer for the Tuscaloosa News for more than 30 years. In his downtime, he's the co-artistic director of the Summer Shakespeare Group, The Rude Mechanicals, yeah. and a singer, songwriter, guitarist for bands such as, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, the Covers, Corvairs? The Corvairs, like the old car. Corvairs. Un unsafe okay. at any speed, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Crying Jags, the Damn yeah. Dirty Apes. Mm -hmm. The Simple Tones, MHC, wow. and the Biscuit Cannons, <laughs> and, and the it sounds like a lot now. Typing pool, it is a lot. <laughs> it um, sounds like a lot when you say it all at once. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about modest, it for twenty years. Yeah. yeah. His modest art collection has more pieces <laughs> by Glenn House than any other artist. That's um, true. So I love that you're a collector. And yeah. then also we have Jessica Peterson here, who will be um, just kind of popping in to you know chime in about Glenn um so I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce out do you want me to go ahead and share my screen yeah why don't we just start with that sure okay yeah just let everybody see a picture of that pretty face and his grotesque faces so what we should be seeing soon is uh Glenn with some of the face sculptures he made these were very popular still are there you go the ones you can tell the ones with a teardrop are his aunt Ida because Aunt Ida was the one who told him if he went into art as a career, he would be nothing but an educated fool. So those are Aunt Ida faces. The rest of them are just more. Well, he told me a couple of them are mine too, but I'm not sure which ones. I think he said that to everybody. Did he ever tell you, Jessica, that, he, that was one of your faces? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, you're too pretty. That's what it is. <laughs> So anyway, I wrote out some stuff about Glenn. I interviewed him many times over the years. We were close friends. He came into my life at a time when I really needed uh, a figure like him for some reason. I don't think he knew that. It just sort of happened. Look at that face. You know, he was he was gentle, warm, friendly. That doesn't even really tell the whole story there. But he was the kind of guy who always had a story. Whether it was real or not, whether it was true or not, it didn't really matter because by the time he got finished telling it, you'd be caught up in it anyway. Let me just start with um, a little background. To, to understand Glenn, you really should know about the dirt that he sprang from, and I mean that literally. Um, he grew up in a place uh, that was outside Gordo. It wasn't in Gordo proper. They weren't that fancy. It was actually out on State Road uh, 17. I want to make sure I get all this right. Near Gordo, several acres his family owned. His parents were uh, Norman Lee House and Lucille Hollingsworth House. They didn't have a lot of money. They were pretty poor. They were, okay, I'm not going to use the joke, but they were dirt poor. They didn't go on vacation the way most of us did. They didn't go to the beach. They didn't go to Six Flags. They couldn't afford to. They dug. They literally went out and dug in the dirt. Until I met Glenn, I'd never thought of that <laughs> as, a, as a thing people did, unless you were an archaeologist. And they were, in a sense, amateur archaeologists, I guess. But uh, Lucille was the one who was really the collector. She liked to take the kids out um, on these vacations. She, I mean, she called them vacations, digging in the dirt. They weren't archaeologists, but they did uncover stuff. And the sheer mass of all the <laughs> objects that she gathered became a museum almost of their own will. It, it, it achieved a kind of uh, gravitational heft just by the masses of them. Back in 1962, now this was after Glenn would have left the house and been out working on his own. It wasn't actually called a museum, but it was becoming that. 
uh, it was in 1962 that Norman gave his wife a one acre room, sorry, a one room house over their acres to display. Let me see what I wrote here. Over decades, that collection spilled over to several buildings across seven acres. There were seven children, a lot of sevens in here. So just keep that in mind. Glenn was the one who suggested the, the name Moss Seals Museum of Miscellanea because there wasn't really, there wasn't really a, a, an idea behind it. I think so much as just pulling things together in, in these great <laughs> rows and rows of glass and stuffed animals. And it's really hard to describe unless you were there. Um, but when, when he designed the sign for her, she loved it. Ma Seals Museum of Miscellanea. She loved it so much she didn't tell him that he misspelled her name. She, he actually added an extra L after Ma Seal. There's only one L. It felt... The museum, when you go inside it, it would feel like it was alive and breathing, even though everything in it was inorganic. Some of it had been formerly organic. There were more than 4,000 bottles they found. And these were things like, oh, back in the day when you see that heavy uh, leaded silver glass, you know, kind of a bluish tint to it, medicine bottles and tinctures and notions. There were, you know, Coca-Cola type bottles, but there were also... Uh, decanters, you know, whiskey decanters, like in the shape of luxury cars and that sort of thing. There was a, one entire building, and I think this was the original building that Norman gave her, but I'm not sure about that, that was just full of dolls. And you want to talk nightmare uh, scenario, walk into that room on a broad daylight, and the light was kind of dim in that room for some reason. And all you would see at first until your eyes adjusted were eyes just up and down the rows. And there was no intent behind it that I know of. Lucille just kind of saw things that way. There you go. That's Lucille and Norman. And that's the sign that, uh, that Glenn painted for him. That building, the one you're looking at there, it's one of the larger ones. And that's where a lot of the glassware was and a lot of the ceramics. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there's some of the dolls that just that gives me nightmares looking at it again these are the things that used to be on top of telephone poles to um, prevent um, electricity electric shock i can't think of the word i'm trying to say right now but there's so many words in there um there were uh six generations of house family photos and memorabilia that's where we saw some of that uh, the army notice earlier there was a replica of a pre-civil war bedroom an entire log cabin country store that was one of the later additions it was uh it was actually a country store they just bought and moved to the property um there were literal stuffed animals this is where the organic part kind of begins to come in because lucille took a mail order uh taxidermy course I guess this is what people did before YouTube. When you wanted to learn something, you sent off for it by mail. So she stuffed a buffalo head, which was very impressive until it began to leak. Um, squirrels, a lot of squirrels. There was, in fact, a squirrel band. Uh, and, and I think there was a, oh yeah, a possum playing checkers. That was one of my favorites. This is where, <laughs> I think where Glenn probably got his sense of whimsy. Uh, you have to admit that, uh, it, it, it didn't really have a narrative, as, as far as I could tell. Um, oh, one thing, this is a, a little unusual, and the statute of limitations has passed, but they actually dug up a human body at one point. And now, it wasn't fresh, so there was no organic matter. It was a skeleton, and it was embedded in clay, and it was probably the piece of clay they dug up, because they dug around it, obviously, once they found bone. It was about seven feet long, maybe. And it was on display in the museum for the longest time, at least until the early 90s, until somebody said, hmm, maybe that should be interred. And it turned out, uh, or at least they think, by uh, whatever testing they could do, that it was a Native American. The university came along with the uh, Moundville Museum, which is south of town. It's an archaeological museum, and they uh, created proper interment there. The kids, uh, okay, wait a minute, I had a thing. Oh, yes, the 1970 story in the New York Times, which is quoted in, or quoted in Jessica's book, which we'll talk about in a little bit. She said, when our youngsters were little, we couldn't afford to take them places. Some of their friends would go visiting and come back and tell about the things they saw, and mine wanted to go so much. She said to herself, if God would let me, I would have a place in Pickens County where children could go for nothing. So that was about... I would guess that was the overriding thought for her when she created it, was a place people could go for nothing, children especially. 
And you would. And you, when you went out there for the first time and you didn't really know what to expect, you would kind of, it had kind of a hallucinogenic effect. You would just wander around wondering what this meant because it didn't really seem to mean anything so much as just finding beauty in the mundane, you know, literally digging art out of the dirt. I mean, hoarder, hoarder is such an ugly word. I don't want to use that. But she was a gatherer. She was a, a conglomerator or accumulator. She was a, <laughs> okay, I wrote this down, but I'm going to say it anyway. She was a reserver and a preserver. She was a layaway, sock away, put aside for a rainy day, raider of the lost art. She collated, but what she meant by it, I don't know. So the kids, as they will, grew up and out, all seven of them. Glenn was the oldest. Glenn served in the army from 51 to 54. And he used to say, I volunteered to go to war, but the only water I crossed was the Chattahoochee River. Masil's health began to decline tragically. There we go. There's some army records and Gaines, his brother right there below. You can see went to the Navy. I think Gaines actually did serve overseas. Um, her, her health began to decline. She was entering her ninth decade. The museum began to fall to pieces. It was not looking good by about 1994. The power had been cut off, spider, spider webs, cobwebs connected everything. There was the squirrels and the dolls were overrun. So I interviewed Mossiel uh, at her nursing home. This was 1998, October. The family had made the hard decision to auction off the, the contents of the museum and people came from everywhere. It was a three day like a party, really, like every house party, it was a party. But it was, you know, had its tragic element because things were going. She did show up. She was she was in a wheelchair and she could watch. And it was a very melancholy time. You know, she she felt deeply about those things, almost as much as she did her kids, I think. Because she said, let's see, when I interviewed her, yeah, here we go. She had a really sharp memory, by the way. She could remember things that happened decades before just like that, but she would sometimes repeat things she just said to me a few minutes before. But she said, okay, here we go. We raised some good children, me and Norman, but it seems to me that next to the children, digging was the happiest times. And then she enjoyed visiting and talking about it, but she kept looking around this room. And the room, let me say, it was pretty pretty nice. The, the, the people who were taking care of her were very kind. I think they were doing a great job. It was probably 20 by 20, and it was, to me, full of stuff. But to her, you know, seven acres down to one room, it was a diminution. She said, I never threw anything away. <laughs> I think that's clear. My husband used to tell it he had to climb in the window to go to bed. And then she said, you wouldn't think about doing it. You just get kind of caught up. So she was there up until the last she passed away on December 31st, 1999. It was near midnight. In fact, I ran back to the office and I called Glenn and talked to him and we wrote a story. Um, she almost made it to the new century. After the army, Glenn had gone to work for uh, Dan Kilgo. This is where we get to the, probably his most famous or at least most seen work of art. And one that's really, in, there we go. It's really an icon of Tuscaloosa, that, that neon sign. That doesn't show the blue eye that's actually right there is winking. If you look closely though, and this is the obverse side, there we go, there's a nice close up. You can kind of see where he, he created it from the word Glenn. His mom, Lucille, showed him how to write his name into a crescent moon face. Uh, he was working for Dan Kilgo, who's an advertising uh, guy, and his, his job is to design a sign for this motel that's out in Alberta. Alberta is an area west, sorry, east of Tuscaloosa. It's in Tuscaloosa, but it's east of the university. And it used to be a very, it used to be a fancy place to go. The Bear Bryant would take his players out to the Moonwinks because it was so far out of town and I measured it and it's about two miles. It was so far from the university that he felt his players could go there and be removed from the uh, temptations of campus on a game weekend. So Bear and his teams, all of those champions, spent many, many nights under that sign. It, it blinked and winked from the late 50s up until just recently, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But um, 
he carved that uh, from his name. Some of those letters fell out as he did it, but it does at some point. You could see Glenn. There was a bow tie down here that was one of the ends, but the bow tie had to go. He drew it out on an uh, illustration board and then airbrushed it and then Dayglow brushed it. So it looked just like a neon sign glowing in the dark, he said in an interview with us. He said, if I'd known it was going to become a Southern icon, I would have spent a whole lot more time working on it. At the pay rate he was making for Dan, he made about three bucks for that work, for an image that I don't know how many people, I mean, I would say tens of thousands, maybe more, hundreds of thousands of people have seen. If you're coming in on US 11, the old Birmingham Highway into Tuscaloosa, you couldn't miss it. So kind of a rise of a hill there, and that moon would be shining and winking at you from, well, looked like miles away anyway. It's really become kind of emblematic of Tuscaloosa in, in ways that, you know, Dreamland's Big Daddy face and, and the Bama Theater marquee and, and Bryant Denny's shadow looming over Denny Chimes or the Krispy Kreme Hot Now sign. That's probably as close as analog. Um, when we were slammed on April 27th, 2011 by that tornado that became almost 1.5 miles wide at some points, it wiped out 12.5% of Tuscaloosa in six minutes. And of course, the first days were horrific. Uh, I was working for the Tuscaloosa as, as I have been all these years. You can't really see it, but we won a Pulitzer Prize for the work we did. And it wasn't necessarily that, it was, it was the same work we do all the time, except it was just in an emergency state and people were calling from everywhere. Not everyone had a way to get in touch with their friends, with their family. They knew people were missing, power was down, houses were destroyed, cars were destroyed. Some people only had their phones. So we got texts and social media messages, which is what the Pulitzer Committee noted uh, us for when they, when they gave the award the next year. But we were getting all sorts of questions that were like, you know, where, can I find a list of people who are missing? How can I get in touch with that group? How can I find food and water? Where can I charge my phone? And we sent that information out. We heard from, I mean, all over the place. We got phone calls from Australia, from Canada, from Seattle, France. Uh, I think I took one from Seattle and one from Australia. So we were hearing from all over the world. People knew about this. But then as the days went on, as we began to unbury ourselves, as somebody said, I can't remember who said that first, but we began to get questions that were a little bit more plaintive and a little bit more about specific areas of Tuscaloosa. And the one that came in more than any other was, is the Moonwing sign still standing? Right after Taco Casa, of course, too. Yeah, and it was. And when the power came back on, it began to wink again. Of course, Glenn did a lot more than that. That was the late 50s. He was still a very young man, not long out of the Army. He helped develop and direct the book arts program at the University of Alabama through the library school. Uh, the book arts program is what it sounds like. It's making paper, creating actual books, I mean, literal books, which Jessica is, uh, has done and will show you in a little bit. One of his protégés and the guy who took over the program after Glenn, grad, uh, Glenn retired was Steve Miller. I spoke with him uh, after Glenn's passing in 2014. And he said, Glenn reached out all across campus to make sure that his letter, pre letter press classes were full. There were generations of football players who learned how to print and set type on the fifth floor of the Gorgas Library. Glenn had that kind of personality. He could draw people in. He helped create the first graduate level master's program in the book arts in the United States. He set up the Lost Arch paper mill and popularized Alabama Cozo, which is a kind of paper made from uh, indigenous paper mulberry trees. It's uh, Cozo refers to, I believe, uh, a Japanese, either a Japanese process or a Japanese plant that makes the similar kind of paper. He was all along this time creating his figures in ceramic and clay, and he was painting. And at one point he decided he needed to add photography to his array of skills. So he took a class with, with Gay Burke. Gay Burke was a photography professor for many years. And she had gone to Moss Seals from the 70s on and taken her photography students out there. Gay Burke once described the museum as like walking inside the mind of an artist. So Glenn took or audited one of her classes. I think he was still a professor at the time. 
And he said, I took that class with a full intention of becoming a world famous photographer in the next few weeks. Um, he met a lot of people in that class, 1989. Lee Black, who is a fairly famous artist and one of the many house protégés, I guess you'd say, or friends, uh, one of Lynn's collection. Lee uh, takes photographs. A lot of them were from Moss Seal's collection and builds beautiful frames. She makes collages out of them. She sometimes does time-lapse work with decaying uh, former organic flesh. They're just, they're indescribably beautiful, except I just tried to describe them. So I guess they're indescribably beautiful. Look up Lee Black sometimes. So met Kathy Fetters, who does this kind of gorgeous reimagining of photographs. She'll take a photograph that either is in black and white or maybe in muted colors, and she paints it in these dazzling rainbows that she sees when she looks at them. So she was in that class too, and she became his wife. In fact, Kathy um, was inspiration for several of my bands that um, Holly mentioned earlier. We always had to play whenever Glenn was around. Kathy's clown, because that's what he said he was. It was like, here he comes, there's Glenn, he's Kathy's clown. So all my bands played Kathy's clown at the festival and wherever else we saw him. At Gordo Mule Day and Chicken Fest, which I was invited to play twice, thanks to Glenn. So that is a great honor if you don't know the music of that. Musicians line up to play that. So he met, uh, when he was meeting Lee, I like this. He told me the first thing she said to me was not, hello, how are you? but is that your mother who's got the museum out in Gordo? So he was uh, he was famous before he knew it in a way, just by being the son of a wonderful creative artist herself. But he quickly realized he was better critiquing photography than making it. And Black was shooting the kind of photos he wanted to shoot, he said, so why should he? And besides, it turned out he was allergic to darkroom chemicals and claustrophobic to boot. Glenn said, we learned to work together, to show together, to encourage each other. And so evolved a group that included Lee, it included Kathy, it included Butch House, that's Glenn's son, Glenn Jr. Butch is a sculptor and metal worker. His, um, one of his more famous pieces is down in the Kentuck Art Center courtyard. It's the Fire Ant Monument. Um, I don't know. It should be famous. It's kind of like the Bull Weevil Monument down there. Is it Enterprise? Where the Bull Weevil? Um, but the fire ant came into the U.S. through Mobile, through the port, in apparently a shipment of car tires. So Glenn, I'm oh, sorry, Butch built a tower rising up to a big fat tire that I believe was made here in Tuscaloosa at the Goodyear plant, and then a huge terrifying fire ant about six feet across atop it. Um, so clearly the, the line is uh, still going on. So Lee Black, Sherry Warner uh, is one of Glenn's nieces and Sandy House were among that group too. And they bought a former Napa auto parts store. Now this was in downtown, that's, that's the inside. They fixed it up nice, right? It, this was in downtown Gordo. So this was real tall cotton. Um, it was a Napa auto parts store. They couldn't get the sign down in time for the opening. So Glenn Butch, sorry, Glenn Jr. went up and crossed out everything but the letters that spelled out art. Black described uh, the work that they were drawing from this way. It was the quintessential environment where the familiar was made strange. Ma Seals showed me the value of what others might reject or disregard. So the son of the, the collector, he became a collector himself, but he collected artists. He, he did continue to work, of course, um, but he also liked to watch other people work. There's, there's something about the chemistry of the people that inspired him and inspired others. And among those people uh, were Amos Kennedy, a wonderful printer, and Jessica. And why don't we bring Jessica in here so I can get my my throat undry and she can tell us a little bit about the book she worked on about this i think this is fascinating hi jessica hi coming in from new orleans yeah i used to live in um tuscaloosa i spent a long time in tuscaloosa and gordo and then moved to new orleans to have a baby um <laughs> um yeah i i lived i was one of the artists one of the last artists that glenn collected um i was a student <laughs> at the book arts program in alabama um and 
um, decided to go out, heard that there was a bunch of printing presses out in Gordo and decided to go out to Gordo to see if I could print in Gordo instead of on the fifth floor of Gorgas Library, which didn't have any windows. So um, I, I was fresh from New York City and had never been in the South before and met Glenn and Kathy. And um, it was a uh, definitely a culture shock on both sides, but I ended up <laughs> um, staying in Gordo for um, like five years and living in the back of the print shop. Um, Glenn and Kathy bought another, um, the grocery store in Gordo, that was the old grocery store and turned it into- It was right across shop. the street, wasn't it? Yeah, um, and it was, um, they had been driving around Alabama buying and getting donated printing presses and metal and wood type from closing print shops who closed because of um, digital printing. So they had a whole building full of printing presses and movable type, which was like an amazing thing for someone like me who, who's interested in letterpress printing. Um, so I moved into, they invited me to, when I graduated from the book arts program, to move into the back of the print shop. Um, Amos Paul Candy was already living in the grocery store, so they divided the space into two apartments. And Glenn told Amos, like, that he was collecting, he had a lot of printing presses, but he needed to collect some printers. So he collected Amos first, and then I came in. And Amos <laughs> wasn't, didn't know there was going to be another printer, so was a little <laughs> shocked. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, but um, after I lived in Gordo for a while, um, my main motivation was about having access to printing and this amazing collection of equipment. But I kept hearing about this museum and about Masil and um, Glenn's the kind of person who would tell you a story and you would look up, he would invite you into his kitchen, make you some cornbread. And then like five hours later, you'd <laughs> leave and you would be like, what happened? I don't, I was just <laughs> coming by to get a key. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, I heard all these stories about the museum and I, I couldn't really believe them because I was like, this can't be possible that this woman taught herself taxidermy and that the New York Times came in the 70s and did an article about it and that there was a human body and there's just like everything that I heard about this museum, I thought couldn't possibly be true. So I made a book about the museum based on what I could find um, in actually 2008 from people's memories and from like newspaper articles and what I found in old buildings in Gordo. So um, the book's called Masil's Museum of Miscellanea and it was a limited edition artist book because it was printed on handmade paper, which is something that was important to me and to the contents of the book. Um, so there's not um, many, many copies left. It's in special collections libraries around the country. Um, and I'm working actually on trying to get um, I'm going to do a digital, I'm not, I'm going to print it, not using letterpress or handmade paper. So it'll be more accessible this summer. Um, and that will be, uh, I feel like the information in it is important and I'd like it to be accessible to people. So when that happens, it'll be at Kentuck for sale. Um, but yeah, so, um, that this book exists and it's kind of a catalog of the museum. It's just a list of what was, I could figure out that was in the museum based on people's memories and what I found. But you can see in this image, the top um, right is the taxidermy um, certificate that Masil got. So I found that and it was like proof that she actually did take a correspondence course in taxidermy and did have a Buffalo sent to her from the National Park Service in Utah on a train to Gordo, Alabama. And then you can see it says the place where <laughs> children can go for nothing. That's one of, that's yep. a New York Times article, which I also just found in the New York Times archives. And then Glenn, because he had a background in graphic design and um, production of graphic design, he made a whole bunch of fake ads and fake articles. So the world's greatest cat fisherman is about his brother. And he made this like composite image of a huge catfish with that his brother had caught and wrote an article about it. Like it, it looks like it's a real article, but it's not. Yeah. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Mark, for letting me have Oh, one. thank you. I, I really do want to see this. I hope I get a copy when it comes into mass production or whatever. No, I'm surprised. Wider dis have, distribution. Yeah, thank you. I, well, my library is not, not complete, obviously. I do love that diploma. That is very fancy. That, that is lovely. Um, I miss that guy. You know, she was just telling stories about him, and it it, rem, it reminds me. Yeah, you would walk into his life, and it, and you were in his life. He was a collector. He collected you. I found the quote I was looking for that uh, Sherry, his niece, reminded me of this one. It was actually a story I wrote, but it was quoting Glenn. He said, "My dream is to surround myself with happy, intelligent, energetic, and creative people 
then I can just sit back and watch the work. And Sherry said, as much as he was all of those things, intelligent, happy, energetic, and creative, he loved seeing it and encouraging it in other people. Her other, her other favorite glenism, and this applies to so many parts of life, you knew it was a snake when you picked it up. So I think it looks like we're getting close to the time we want to close out. I just want to read one more thing. Uh, I did write his obituary. Um, it was very hard. Uh, as it always is when somebody you care about. He had for years told me he wanted me to read words over his his grave when he died because two things. He saw me in a seersucker suit and that was a mistake. I really shouldn't have posed for that photo, but I was with Charlton Heston and I was grinning like an idiot. And that's where the band name came from, the damn dirty apes. And he said, I looked like a preacher in that suit. And also he liked the obituaries I'd written for other people. And he wanted me to write some things about him. I don't know if I did it, uh, did injustice or all, but, but I did hear some lovely things from different people like Steve and Maya, who was the former Kentuck director for many years, um, who said he was a uniquely gifted and inquisitive artist, equal parts Southern charm and talent, born of the unique family and circumstances in which he was raised. He mined his personal history to create work crafted to the highest technical standards with only a wink to serious subject matter. That reminds me of the first piece of Glenn art I ever collected he gave to me because I admired it and he was just that kind of guy. It was a painting about yay high and it was a pyramid with a piece of orange cheese in a pyramid shape balanced on the top and a single tear coming on its eye. And knowing what I know now, I wonder if that was supposed to be Aunt Ida, but it was the big cheese was <laughs> The title is what made me want it so badly. It said, it's lonely at the top. Yeah, like Maya said, he was a joy to be around and we'll all miss him. Um, Kathy said this. Um, they'd been together since 91. They'd met a couple of years before and they'd been together since till his death in 2014, sorry, 2014. Said he was always looking around, seeing birds, shooting stars, and rattlesnakes, which after he captured and euthanized one from Ma Seal's collection, he refused to do again. He had absolute curiosity, but a lighthearted, lighthearted curiosity, taking something from everything that was somehow joyful. She said, it's so silent over here right now. I keep looking for him. I hope that continues for a little while longer. Glenn showing up in the corner of our studios and the corners of our minds. Uh, we referred to the Moonwink sign earlier. I should mention that just a few weeks ago, the Moonwink sign was moved. It startled a whole lot of people because we don't know where it's gone. Now, it was on private property, owned by someone who had perfect right to sell it, of course. But the previous owner had been trying to sell it for several years, and it just sort of disappeared one day. We're all still kind of looking. I'm looking. Uh, I'm trying to find out. So if whomever did buy it has plans for it. Tuscaloosa would really like to know. Um, one last thing, and this is something Glenn wrote. Uh, instead of me saying words over him, he wrote his own epitaph. It's called Bottle Digger's Epitaph, and I believe it's in Jessica's book as well. Or I may, I'm sorry, it may not be, but um, you can find it. So Glenn House in his own words. When my demise has come to pass, sprinkle my grave with bits of glass Dig my hole most round and deep down in the oldest dump of a Bama River town. Put my trusty rusty shovel at my side so I can dig o'er the great divide. Lay a broken bitters bottle in each hand and cover my body with trashy sand. Don't weep for me when I'm over the hump because I'll be digging in a heavenly dump. I don't know what else we could say about that. Holly, you want to step in here? Do we have questions or anybody who wants to comment? Love to hear from anybody who has any thoughts about this. If not, I can read more stuff. Yeah, um, I forgot to mention that at the beginning that we we can do a you know a Q and A if anyone has any questions. There's a Q and A um, box or there's a chat box that you can you know type your questions out. Jessica, do you want to pop back in? Um, well, I just, and, I'm looking at the um, participants and I see a lot of people who have been intimately involved in this story <laughs> in one oh. time or another. So it's too bad we can't all um, have a conversation. I know with the presentation mode, it's hard to talk. To I know. We'd yeah, love absolutely. to hear from anybody who has a story or a comment. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming to be the person who knew him best or anything like that. I just knew him a long time and wrote about him. 
Uh, he had many loved ones, obviously. So whoever's got anything they want to share, please tell us. Any I'm stories gonna, about Glenn are welcome. Get the Q&A up, because I don't even see it. There it is. Um, I know sometimes, it. sometimes navigating Zoom can be annoying. <laughs> okay, here's a question. Mm -hmm. um, did Glenn ever talk about the hieroglyphics he put on small clay objects? I have, Jessica, I have a few of those. Do you have an answer for this? I don't know. Um, I have one of those objects. Glenn didn't, he, he had stopped making so many faces when I knew him because he had his fingers, it was hard. He was using clay they dug up from around Gordo and it was very hard clay. So it was hard to manipulate. Um, but he was, I, I have, um, some of those clay objects and he was very mis he wouldn't tell me mm -hmm. what it, what they were so i look at them a lot but they he was really interested um <laughs> in typography and when i look at them more and more i think they're like based on phoenician alphabet which is like the first um alphabet that formed western characters so i think that was his inspiration um, i just sort of grabbed some yeah oh there we go that's yeah. nice yeah you know you're you're probably right he was voracious i mean he just picked up things everywhere. So that's probably true. But he would tell a different story, it seemed, every time I ask him a question. So I'm not happy to see. Yeah. This does the person who weighed in, do you have one of those? Did you yeah. collect some? It's Jeremy Butler. Who... Oh, of course. Hey Jeremy, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> no, the hieroglyphics are a mystery to me, but uh, so many things about Glenn must remain that way, I'm afraid. He said he yes, would... he has a couple of them. Somebody else popping in. Yeah, we um, we we have many stories of Glenn to share. I'm sure that some of them are, are well known, and some of them are just things he would spin out of the seemingly thin air. Like as Jessica was saying, you'd go over to visit, and you'd wake up, and hours had passed. It was like a time machine. He said one of his is in a pyramid shape. Ah, uh, he liked the pyramids. <laughs> he liked that lonely at the top thing. <laughs> I found some other names. It, Jessica, maybe you can, maybe you remember some of these. These are some of the other people who apparently worked at Gordo as well. Reese Green, Craig Patterson, Missy Miles, Lisa Stamp, Suzanne Gray. Remember Suzanne? Uh, Sharon Greenwood, Frank Williams. Are they all, they were all part of the collective at one point, weren't they? Or, or were they more yeah, think, sort of affiliates? Yeah, everybody, I think, um, after they bought, after Glenn and Kathy bought some of the buildings in the downtown area, there was a real push to try to make it a, to make a very formal crossroads star collective of people from Gordo and people from Tuscaloosa. And I think um, with all of those things, they always have their time and place. So I think um, those people that you mentioned were all in revolving through at one time or another. And were they all printmakers yeah. or different? Um, it was all a bunch of different artists. Like um, Reese is a, um, mosaic artists and Lisa Stamps did um, painting and drawing and it was really interesting um, and humbling for me to I was coming from you know the University of Alabama's MFA program and then to for me to be partnering with people who were just making their work because that's what they loved and I think that's something that Glenn did and that Amos did that was a really good lesson to me as a young artist at the time about how to make your work yeah, I think it fits with uh, the Kentuck aesthetic. I'm not sure how many people down Dothan area might know Kentuck, but we mentioned earlier, Holly worked there for a while. And it's a year-round art center that built around a uh, festival, which itself was a Northport Heritage Festival. Northport being uh, on the north side of the Black Warrior here, Tuscaloosa was founded because it was the highest navigable point on the river. There used to be a waterfall here, which apparently was very, very lulling and, and, and warming. But when they built the whole lock and dam that went away. But the port was on the Northern side and it was called at various times, Cane Tuck or Ken Tuck and became Northport because I think they were trying to clean it up a little. It was a place where all the fights and the bars and every you know fun thing was happening. But Kentuck Art Center built down there from a Northport Heritage Festival and Kentuck Festival is now, I think this year's his 52nd year. It's a year round nice. center focused on collect, uh, it's a built around outsider and folk art and crafts. It's it's very vivid, very bright, very much like uh, Holly's own museum. I noticed uh, the Bell's Gallery. Let's plug it. 
while we're here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but the Kentuck Center is that kind of aesthetic, I think, where the Gordo Art Collective uh, displayed a lot at the festival and at its various museum galleries during art nights and such, because they really fit that sort of, as, as Jessica was just saying, they did it just out of their hearts. It didn't really come from a formal school. It was just what they felt and they, the way they felt was shown in what they did. We should all. Yeah, I, I remember at Kentuck whenever they, they had their art show. Was it like every June or July or something? It was June or July. I remember because I played a few of them and it was blistering hot out in the courtyard. Yeah. But I remember they just came in and it was like everybody just like scurried and nailed and you came in and it was just art everywhere in no particular order. Or <laughs> it just was yeah. there and it looked amazing. It looked great. So Robin um, just it's not really a question, but more of a comment. Um, sure. She is um, staff at WMA, and she said she loved right. learning about Glenn and his fascinating family. I can't wait to share with our tours at WMA. The students have really gotten a kick out of the faces. Jessica, yeah. your book um, in the Kudzu Soliloquy Show has given me so much wonderful knowledge about the region. So happy to have something to show visitors when they ask, what is Wiregrass? Because that is a very common question. Not just the museum, but in general, the wire grass, what does that mean? Um, and I, I agree. It's so, I learned a lot in that book. Um, so, um, yeah, wave that thing around. There we yes. go. <laughs> I love it. But Jessica will also be um, having an artist talk uh, specifically about her book um, that's in the Kudzu Soliloquy show. Um, I don't even, is that in June? I yeah, think? I think it's June 22nd. <laughs> June 22nd. I so. my calendar. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't look at my calendar before. Uh, <laughs> I meant to write it down um, before we started, and I totally forgot. It's very important, so, yet, and I'm very excited about it, but I didn't write the date down yet. Yeah, I think you're right, though. I think it is the 22nd. Um, and, the sh and the show closes on the 24th. Not I keep saying the 27th, but yeah, I think it's a couple days before the show actually closes. So, so the show will be up yeah. how long? Because I might want to come see this. I'm not, I'm so Until... June 24th. Okay, cool. I'm mm -hmm. working on 12th night, but we'll take a weekend off and come back. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen Dothan in a long time. Yeah, Dothan was uh, pretty small when I grew up. I don't know how much different it is now. I think it was only about 40,000 people. So, you know, the I main things to like do were play 70... baseball. Yeah, well, oh, yeah? that's still yeah. a thing. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot bigger. Um, Jessica, what were you, were you saying something about, are you going to come to the show or... Um, I'd love to. Um, and it, the talk is on the twenty second, and it's a Zoom. Twenty second, okay. Yeah, of June at six. Yeah. Is that yes, a is that six. a weekend or? Uh, it's a Thursday. Yeah, like okay. Oh, I could so, take a weekend. Yeah, we'll see. Well, thanks, be four hours. Thanks both of you for Thank for you. being here and sharing, and I was so happy to to bring that part of um, Alabama to the Wiregrass and to share um, his legacy with people because I think it is so important. And I, I know whenever I moved there, he was kind of like this like mythical you know, <laughs> yeah, person absolutely. that everybody just revered and loved. And you have to meet about. Glenn kind of person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, all right. Well, thanks so much. Y'all have you. a great Mark, night. So it was really nice to hear um, that. It was very, it was great to hear the timeline and the, that you also about the dead body, which was never confirmed or denied. So I saw it. <laughs> I saw it, and it startled me. But at first, I thought it was a, a mock-up, you know. And then they're like, "No, that's an actual." Oh my gosh! <laughs> Lovely people, every one of them. We ought to design, Jessica, you ought to do this, a, a house family tree. Somebody needs to do that. That would be an art project, right? That's a good idea. We should put that. <laughs> <laughs> that would take a couple of books, probably. Yeah. Good seeing everybody. Thanks for talking. Bye. All right. Have a, have a great night.